All right, pits one and three. Nothing can be done about that now, but they've got eight games left, which means eight more chances to try to salvage something out of this 2023 season. It remains to be seen how much they'll salvage out of it, and maybe even how much is possible to be salvaged. But on today's Morning Pit, we're going to talk about some of the things they need to do if they're going to give it their best effort here over the next eight games, starting with this week's trip to Virginia Tech to take on the Hokies, who are also one and three. So what does Pitt need to do to get better and try and win some of these uh, final eight games? We're breaking it down here on the Morning Pit on YouTube.com slash PantheLair.com. All right, Tuesday edition of the Morning Pit here on YouTube.com slash PantheLair.com. Like I said, we're going to be talking about some of the, I, I think the keys for Pitt going forward over the next eight games. I got about five things written down here that, um, well, uh, I, I think are important and some of them are pretty obvious because ultimately there's only so much you can do when it comes to football uh, analysis and that kind of thing. You know, you know what the biggest thing Pitt needs to do? They need to score more points. But we'll go a little bit deeper than that on maybe how they can score more points and what they need to do going forward over the final eight games. There's some tough games out there. I don't think there's any question about it. I mean, you've got, you know, Virginia Tech this week is a little bit light. Um, they, they don't look very good. Boston College doesn't look very good. Uh, Wake Forest is looking a little questionable after losing to Georgia Tech by two touchdowns um, this past weekend, and, and they they might be vulnerable. But beyond that, I mean, you know, if you're looking for a way to get to six wins for bowl eligibility, and I guess we set this, the first bar there, you're really looking at those three potentially, and then you still need two more wins out of Louisville, who seems to be on fire under Jeff Brom. Um, the, the two big ones of Florida State and uh, Notre Dame, and then Syracuse and Duke. That's that's a challenging slate. Syracuse and Duke are both undefeated. Louisville is undefeated. All three of those teams are 4-0. Florida State obviously is 4-0. Somehow they fell in the polls after winning at Clemson. I don't really understand that, but that's okay. They're still going to have a chance to put themselves in the mix at the end of the season. And then Notre Dame is 4-1 after losing to Ohio State uh, at home over the weekend. So it's going to be, uh, you know, it's a challenging stretch. There's no question about it. I think we all talked before the season about it being a challenging schedule and whether it was or whether it wasn't. But I think with, with teams like Duke and Syracuse and Louisville playing at a higher level and getting this far undefeated, uh, it looks more, and you know, it looks more challenging than it did at the beginning. I think at the beginning of the year, we looked at Notre Dame, Florida state, and probably North Carolina, given the quarterback situation, which we obviously were right about that, about that being difficult. Uh, but we looked at those three games as probably the biggest challenges on the schedule. Duke would be improved but how, how, by how much. Uh, Syracuse would be Syracuse, Louisville, Wake Forest. You know, I, I don't think there were high expectations for any of those teams. Not to mention you know West Virginia and Cincinnati out of the Big 12. Obviously, the schedule looks more daunting now, having, you know, with three teams sort of unexpectedly at 4-0 in Louisville, Syracuse, and Duke. Um, Florida State and Notre Dame more or less humming along as we expected them to. And then these really unfortunate losses at West Virginia and Cincinnati. And those two, those are two games that are going to haunt, come back and haunt this team. I think they already are haunting this team because it's a whole lot different right now if they're 3-1 and one coming out of a loss in North Carolina than if they're, you know, as they are, 1-3 and three coming out of a loss in North Carolina. Now, I have no doubt in my mind that if Pitt had started the season 3-0 and and lost to North Carolina, we would be having lots of conversations on the message board this week about how Narduzzi can't get it done and Frank Signetti is terrible and Phil Dracovic is, is, is trash and everybody should be fired and this program is never going to take the next step because that's what we do after every loss. But it hits home a little bit more. It's a little closer to the heart, so to speak, when it comes after three consecutive losses you you just couldn't afford to blow those games not when you could have won at least one of them if not both uh, you couldn't afford to to waste those opportunities and and quite frankly if you are who we thought you were you win those games i mean those are winnable games um and and three and one obviously is much better than one and three um the alternative is pretty ugly right now and it's put a lot of stress on you to go a minimum of five and three over the final eight games which is not easy to do um, but not impossible so what do they need to do 
Well, first, what you need to do is like this video and subscribe. YouTube, YouTube.com slash PantheLurk.com. You thought I wasn't going to do it, did you? YouTube.com slash PantheLurk.com. It's our video channel. It's where you can get all of our pit video content, these daily morning pit videos and uh, post-game press conferences, weekly press conferences, player interviews, coach interviews, highlights, all different kinds of things you can get right here at YouTube.com slash PantheLurk.com. So like this video and subscribe so you don't miss any of it. And then head over to the website. PantherLair.com, Panther-Lair.com, Pittsburgh.Rivals.com for all the Pitt sports coverage, football, basketball, and uh, recruiting. Lots of that right there at PantherLair.com, lots of coverage, everything you need, and then message boards where Pitt fans have been very, very active over the past few days, past few weeks, talking about this team and this program and where it is in the grand state of things. So go check it out at the website, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com. All right, five things. Five things Pitt needs to do to give themselves a chance to go five and three or better over these final eight games. And, and you know, I know you probably scoff at me even saying or better uh, because it, it feels pretty unlikely. And I'll, I'll admit that it feels pretty unlikely. Five and three feels like a daunting enough challenge with how the team has played. I think there are some steps they can take and I think there's there's a direction they can head where they give themselves a good chance to go 5 and 3 over the final 8 and and maybe even steal one to go 6 and 2 over the final 8. Um I'm not predicting that either one of those things is going to happen, but I'm just saying I think there's some things they can do. Number 1, and this might be the most important thing Pitt does over the the, the final 8 games. They they've got to get an early lead. They really do have to get an early lead. Now, there's a lot of like sort of, you know, dumb football cliche in that, in saying Pitt needs to get an early lead. They need to play from ahead and all this kind of stuff. But I think there, you know, a lot of times with football cliches, they some of them apply to certain teams a little more than others. You know, everybody obviously needs to score more points. You know, everybody needs to, you know, wants to stop the run. Everybody wants to make an opponent one dimensional. Everybody wants to do this or do that. But for this Pitt football team in particular, it's especially crucial that they are playing from ahead as much as possible for a few reasons. One, they're just not built to, to come back, to manufacture a large comeback. Going into halftime down 11 against North Carolina was almost a death sentence. When they gave up a touchdown on Carolina's first possession, it was a death sentence. That ended Pitt's chances. They were not coming back from being down 18. And part of that is because they just were never going to stop Drake May. And so even if they scored a touchdown to cut the lead to 11, they, they were never going to, you know, Drake May would just go put up another touchdown. And I think he would do it with relative ease, despite the fact that he got sacked five times in that game. I think you would get that touchdown and be back to 18. You would never really get that close. You're not going to face Drake May every week and be under the threat of that happening. But because of their lack of an aggressive attacking passing game, either by choice or just because of that's what they have, you know, in the booth and on the field, they're not really able to score quickly. And I have a theory, and, and I don't know if a coach would agree with it. I don't know if anyone would agree with it. And maybe I'm completely wrong about it, and that's fine. But I have a theory that as we all sort of try and figure out what these new clock rules do of rolling the clock on first down, one of the one of the sort of unintended consequences, and there was really only one intended consequence, and that's to speed up the game, but you know, sort of an unintended consequence of that is that if you are behind by a significant amount, if you're behind by three scores in the second half, it is going to be really difficult unless you can do quick strike, two, three, four play drives, one play drives where you get touchdowns. Because as if you have to take seven, eight, ten plays to march down the field for a touchdown with the clock still rolling, you're gonna you're gonna take a lot of time off, and you're gonna limit your opportunities to score the number of times that you need to score. And I think that's that applies across the board. I think it's tough to come back from being down three scores in the in the second half. It probably it always was tough to come back from being down three scores in the second half. But I think that rolling clock makes it even more difficult. And then you throw in the complicating factor that I just said that Pitt doesn't have that downfield attacking quick strike passing offense. Now it's really hard. And if they do fall behind by three scores in the second half, they they really. You can't say they have no chance, but the, the, their, their percentage chance is single digits of coming back because they're just not built to do that. The offensive scheme isn't designed to do that, and, and they don't have the players to do that, or they haven't shown that they have the players to do that. 
So they've got to be ahead. And you look at that North Carolina game, I brought this stat up yesterday. What, the, the first half, they had 13, the running backs in the first half against North Carolina had 13 rushing attempts for 62 yards. That's great. That's almost five yards per carry. It's, it's good, you know. Um, perfectly good production from the running backs. They carried the ball three times in the second half. Three times. You say, well, why'd you go away from the run? Well, by the time Pitt got the ball in the second half, they were down by 18 points. They were trailing by three scores. And so they, you know, I hate when coaches say, well, we, we just couldn't run, you know, when you have basically the whole half. But I think in terms of a three score game with a clock that's going to keep running on every first down, you do have limit, you know, your opportunities to run are limited. Even if you're getting, what did I say? They got 32 yards on those three handoffs to the running backs in the second half. Your opportunities are limited because you are playing you are down by so much that you almost have to pass Pitt can't find itself in a situation where it has to pass because if they do they are toast uh that was the case against Cincinnati uh, at least in the coach's mind I I felt like the Cincinnati game they were I, I felt like they were close enough that they could have kept running in the second half just bring up the stat book here the end of well it was 20 to 7 at the end of the first half and then Cincinnati scored a touchdown, not on the first drive of the second half, but they scored a touchdown to go up 27-7. So at that point, it was three scores. And so, you you know, you pretty much were out of reach of using your running game. And, and you saw, I, I think, you know, the, they, they went away from it because they felt like they had to go away from it because they were down by a significant amount. You know, they didn't need to go away from it in the West Virginia game because the game was never that far out of reach. And, uh, you know, Carolina, I kind of understand. Once they went down... 18 they were sort of out of options they needed to get it to one score before they could start establishing the run again but they needed to pass to get to one score they're not very good at passing as you might have already come to know so that's one thing they, they've got to be ahead i mean they've got to play from ahead and that's that's a total team effort you know but i do think i would even go so far as to take the ball to open the game just to put yourself in a position to take the lead and play with a lead for as long as you possibly can. Um, I, I think it's that important. Number two, they, they, they've got to run the ball. They've got to establish the run. They are at the bottom of the ACC, next to last in the ACC, in rushing yards per game, rushing yards per attempt. I think they're even you know next to the bottom of the ACC in rushing attempts overall. They're just they're not running the ball well enough. They're not running the ball often enough. They're not doing it. They've had two games this season, Cincinnati and North Carolina, where they ran the ball less than 30 times. And that includes like the quarterback runs and the sacks and all that. Their running backs are getting even less work than that. The, you, the way this pit team is built, the way the offense is designed, they have to be able to run the ball. And, and if the game situation, if the game script or whatever, you know, people like to say, if that gets out of hand, well, you're kind of screwed, but you need to be able to commit to the run as much as you can, as early as you can, as often as you can. You saw it at the beginning of the West Virginia game. You saw it at the beginning of the North Carolina game. They need to be able to do that. It's crucial. And when they go to Virginia Tech this weekend on Saturday night, look, Virginia Tech just lost to Marshall. Marshall threw for 166 yards, ran for 214 Rutgers, the week before that, beat Virginia Tech with 46 passing yards. They ran for 256 and four touchdowns. Purdue threw for 248 yards. Hudson Card, actually, who the quarterback who transferred from Texas, the guy who was uh, the senior when Nate Yarnell was a junior. If you recall, you remember that story? We all learned about Hudson Card in Pittsburgh because Nate Yarnell was his backup and Card got hurt and Yarnell took over and led him into the playoffs and then Card came back and lost in the playoffs. Anyway, Card transferred to Purdue, threw for 248 yards against Virginia Tech, no touchdowns, but Purdue also ran for 179 and three scores. Even Old Dominion in the season opener, Virginia Tech won that game, but Old Dominion only threw for 94 yards. They ran for 201, net rushing. This Virginia Tech team has given up 200-plus rushing yards in three out of four games, and the other game they gave up 179 and three touchdowns. Run the ball. Run the ball. Run the ball. You can establish the run against this team. You need to establish the run against this team. Run the ball. Rodney Hammond is good, provided he's healthy. I think he showed 
Uh, you know, he has shown enough times how good he can be. Sebo Flemister seems to make a play every time he gets an opportunity. He had one carry against North Carolina and went for 10 yards. You're not using your weapons. You're not using the one thing you might actually be good at on offense, aside from throwing to Gavin Bartholomew. But we'll, we'll get to El Barto in a second. Run the ball. And it might be boring, and it's not going to be exciting for anybody. And everybody's going to talk about your Stone Age, uh, Stone Age offense, and how you're, you know, you're, you're trying to play like it's the Big Ten in the 1980s and all that. But let me tell you a secret: it might be the way you can actually win football games. Winning football games? Who'd have thunk it? I, I, I kid. They want, they obviously want to run the ball. I know Frank Cignetti wants to run the ball. I know Pat Narduzzi wants to run the ball. They need to do it. You got to stay in the lead, though to be able to keep running because if you fall behind by too much then you can't a lot of these teams are going to face they should be able to take an early lead and and establish the run and it's going to be their best chance to win number three focus on the playmakers and and i think we talked about this a little bit last week we talked about this week that you have a couple guys that the ball needs to go to and and the, and there are probably a couple guys you need to just really not waste time with um, you need to get the ball to 6, 9, and 86. Those are your three main guys. Those are the three main guys. If Rodney Ham is healthy, he needs to get the bulk of the carries just like he did against North Carolina. Um, you need to be throwing to Kanate Mumfield. You need to be throwing to Gavin Bartholomew. Gavin Bartholomew has 12 targets through four games. That's an average of three targets per game. Puts him on pace for 36 targets in the regular season. Last year, he had 36 targets in 13 games. That's not enough. Gavin Bartholomew needs a minimum of four targets per game. You need to feed El Barto. He is one of your weapons. He's one of your best offensive players. He's one of the few guys that I think Pitt fans would say, you know what, I don't have any complaints about him. Because they got complaints about everybody right now. But not him. Get him the ball. Get Mumfield the ball. Get him in the ball. And continue to elevate Kenny Johnson and make him a bigger part of the, the, the offensive game plan. And Pat Narduzzi said yesterday that, uh, you know, Christian Bayer's first interception, it was, you know, pass to the end zone, and Johnson took his foot off the gas a little bit. If he had kept running hard, he would have had a chance, blah, blah, blah. Uh, fine. He's a freshman. Keep coaching him up. Keep elevating his role. All right? I like Dejon Reynolds. You know what I think about Bub Means, but Bub Means has shown us who he is. Get the ball to Mumfield. Get the ball to El Barto. Get the ball to Hammond. And then work Kenny Johnson in more and more the fourth thing is that you know on defense they just need to continue improving i was shocked to, to notice uh it, it, we were talking about this on the message board yesterday morning the pits actually still tied for 11th in the nation in sacks per game like three and a half sacks per game i didn't think they got they, they were playing well enough that the pass rush was effective enough to be at three and a half sacks per game they had five against drake may so that's going to help the numbers they had four against wofford that's going to help the numbers as well cincinnati and west virginia ran the ball a lot so you're not going to get as many sacks it's not necessarily you know gonna it's not conducive to, to running up the numbers game but aside from the numbers it just hasn't felt like the pass rush has been that effective but they are putting up the numbers so they are getting into the backfield and they are making some plays the defense just needs to keep improving. Yeah, Drake may beat him up. And yeah, Cincinnati beat him up in the first half running the ball. On the whole, this defense I think is more or less on track with where I thought they would be and where they needed to be. Um, they played well against West Virginia. You know, they played well in the second half against Cincinnati. They had their moments against North Carolina, but Drake may did to Pitt's defense what a good quarterback uh, is always going to do to Pitt's defense. You know, 95% of the time, if you face a quarterback of that caliber, that's what he's going to do against Pitt's defense and most defenses that he faces because he's really good. But I think the defense continues to get better, just continues to improve, and, and I think they'll keep building on what they're doing, uh, which we all said all offseason. We said it all summer. We said it all spring. They'll keep getting better. And ideally, by midseason, they'll be playing at a high level. Certainly, by the end of the year, they'll be playing at a high level. And I think this defense is headed in that direction. And I and I think they'll keep improving. And look, after facing Drake May, now they're going to face Virginia Tech. They've got a really good offense at Louisville. Um, Wake Forest is still trying to figure out who they are offensively. Florida State and Notre Dame are what they are. But you know, Syracuse, Boston College, Duke, these are offenses that 
you know, Syracuse and, and Duke have shown some some sparks, but Pitt's defense has faced largely this same Syracuse offense and same Duke offense uh, the last year or two, and they've been able to be successful and make enough plays to give their offense a chance to win. That's our mantra, right? Making you know the defense needs to be good enough to keep the game in range for the offense, and that's what they did against Syracuse and Duke last year, uh, and and they'll have a chance to do it again this season but I think just continued improvement nothing specific from the defense just continued improvement um out of that side of the ball and then you know the fifth thing I I mean you gotta stop being stupid cut it out with the penalties 32 penalties second most in the ACC through four games 32 penalties so far and they got like 16 on offense and you know 13 or some on defense and three or four on special team. I mean, like they're making mistakes all over the place. They're screwing up all over the place. They're lining up off sides a bunch of uh, a handful of times. You know, you, you you got your regular run of pass interference and defensive holding. You're gonna get those penalties because that's what Pitt does. But like off sides, false starts, um, you know, illegal shifts and things like that, taunting and unsportsmanlike conduct, man, grow up. You're not good enough to afford to give anybody 15 yards because you want to taunt somebody. You got to be smarter than that. You got to know the situation and know that like, hey, my team can't afford to give up five yards, let alone 15. And if you, you know, you get called for pass interference on an aggressive play or something like that, that that's one thing. You taunt a guy, you commit some sort of unsportsmanlike conduct penalty, now you're just being stupid. You hit a guy late out of bounds. I don't think they've had any of those, but I mean, you can't do those kinds of things. They're stupid and they hurt the team and, and they're completely unnecessary. There's no upside to that. There might be upside to this play or that play. Oh, a pass interference. Maybe it doesn't get called or something like that. Holding. Maybe it doesn't get called. Th- those are sort of football plays. This extra stuff and it, like the extra stuff with, with extracurricular, the, the, the uh, conduct and that kind of thing. And then the, the basic detail stuff lining up right um not you know jumping and false starting those unforced errors um you have to cut that out you 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 can't afford your team is not good you have such a slim margin of victory right now you can't afford to waste yards like that all right last thing that we got to get to this isn't one of the things they need to do over the final eight games but the last thing we have to do is give a shout out to mac and his senior his season is over the redshirt senior offensive lineman panarduzzi announced it yesterday that gonsalves is going to miss the rest of the year after uh suffering an injury at west virginia he did not play against north carolina we can talk more about that tomorrow just kind of go over some of the offensive line implications and actually that's probably what we will do i think we're going to do one of those five thoughts episodes tomorrow even though i just laid out a bunch of my thoughts already but we're going to cover a bunch of different uh angles tomorrow we'll talk about the offensive line but feel for uh mac and Salvis, his final year at pitt or his redshirt senior season he could potentially come back in 2024 as a super senior he's got that option available to him if he is so inclined but um you know feel for him and uh hope for a, a speedy recovery a healthy recovery and uh you know maybe we'll see him in a pit uniform again that'd be that'd be cool but uh all the best to mac and Savis. disappointed for the news um but you know that's uh you, you'll have this and and particularly in a rough season you, you injuries start to pile up and things get ugly all right, that's it. Make sure you like this video and subscribe, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com so you don't miss any of our video content. And then head over to the website, panther-lair.com. Thanks for checking out the video today. I hope you've had a great start to your week. Enjoy your Tuesday. We'll be back with you tomorrow morning for another morning pit right here, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com.